Welcome, everyone. Uh, uh, call our meeting to order here in House Natural Resources, Fish and Wildlife for the first walkthrough of the Act 250 Commission um, bill. So uh, we have about two hours with Ellen. Welcome, Ellen. Um, and it's 81 pages. My request is that um, we keep level uh, questions kind of high level, and if you're wondering what something's trying to accomplish or how it does that, that's great. But otherwise, let's try to get through it in this first review of the bill. Is somebody online or on the phone? Uh, we're trying to get to hear what be on the phone. Oh, just lit up. I don't know if that's. Um, we, let's try shutting the door. Thank you. Please. Yeah. All right. Ellen Tchaikovsky, Office of Legislative Council. We are looking at what is now draft 5.2. It's dated 1-23-19. There may be drafts in the future, so just this is where we're starting. The bill proposes to make the, follow the following changes to Act 250. Proposing revisions to Act 250's capability and development plan to address climate change and ecosystem protection. Amending Act 250 to include a purpose section that refers to the plan and the specific statutory goals for municipal and regional planning. Amending the criteria to address climate change, including requiring projects to avoid, minimize, or mitigate greenhouse gas emissions, and to be designed to withstand and adapt to climate change. Amending the criteria to address ecosystem protection through protecting forest blocks and connecting hab habitat. The, the bill would also increase the program's ability to protect ecosystems on ridge lines by reducing the elevation threshold from 2,500 to 2,000 feet. Requiring that to be used in Act 250, local and regional plans must be approved as consistent with the statutory planning goals and clarifying that local and regional plan provisions apply to a project if they meet the same standard of specificity applicable to statutes. Page two. As part of a balancing of interests to support economic development in compact centers while promoting a rural countryside and protecting important natural resources, amending Act 250 jurisdiction to allow municipalities to ensure compliance with the Act 250 criteria in centers receiving an enhanced designation under 24 BSA Chapter 76A, and increasing Act 250 jurisdiction in critical resource areas and at interstate interchanges. Because the designation Hang up. under 24 VSA Chapter 76A would affect jurisdiction, the bill provides for a appeal of designation decisions. Clarifying the definition of commercial purpose so that it is not necessary to determine whether monies received are essential to sustain a project. Requiring the development cabinet to meet regularly increasing the per diem rate for district commissioners and the board to $100, repealing the exemption for farming, logging, and forestry when those activities take place in critical resource areas, replacing the Natural Resources Board with a Vermont Environmental Re Review Board, which would hear appeals from the district commissions and the Agency of Natural Resources in addition to the NRB's current duties. The Environmental Division of the Superior Court would continue to hear enforcement and local zoning appeals. Page three, reaffirming the supervisory authority of environmental matters of the board and district commissions in accordance with the original intent of Act 250 as determined by the Vermont Supreme Court. Revising and clarifying the statutory authority on the use of other permits to demonstrate compliance with the criteria, including ensuring the, re the reliability of those permits. All right, section one starts on line 10, and it's revisions to capability and development plan. In the 1973 Act and Resolves number 85, subsection 20 is added to read, 
greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. Climate change poses serious risks to human health, functioning e ecosystems that support the diversity of species and economic growth, and Vermont's tourist, forestry, and agricultural industries. The primary driver of climate change in Vermont and elsewhere is the increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide from the burning of fossil fuels, which has a warming effect that is amplified because atmospheric water vapor, another greenhouse gas, increases as temperature rises. Vermont should minimize its emission of greenhouse gases, and because the climate is changing, ensure that the design and materials used in development enable projects to withstand an increase in extreme weather events and adapt to other changes in the weather and environment. Section two. 1973 Acts and Resolves number 85, section 7A2 is amended to read, ecosystem protection and utilization of natural resources. Healthy ecosystems, clean water, purify air, maintain soil, regulate the climate, recycle nutrients, and provide food. They provide raw materials and resources for medicines and other purposes. They are the foundation of civilization and sustain the economy. These ecosystem services are the state's natural capital. Biodiversity is the key indicator of an ecosystem's health. A wide variety of species cope better with threats than a limited number of species in large populations. So we've broken out into A, B, and C there, and the existing language includes products of the land and the stone and materials under, under the land, as well as the beauty of our landscape, our principal natural resources of the state. <clears throat> Protection of healthy resources in Vermont, preservation of the agricultural and forest productivity of the land, and the economic viability of agricultural units, conservation of the recreational opportunity afforded by the state's hills, forests, streets, and lakes, wise use of the state's non-renewable energy and mineral resources, and protection of the beauty of the landscape are matters of public good. Uses, uses which threaten significantly inhibit these healthy ecosystems and the state's natural and scenic resources should be permitted only when the public interest is clearly benefited thereby. Section three, so now we're into changes to the Act 250 statute. We're adding uh, section 6,000, purpose and construction. The purposes of this chapter are to protect and conserve the environment of the state and to support the achievement of the goals of the capability and development plan and of 24 BSA section 4302C the chapter shall be construed broadly to affect these purposes. Section 6001, definitions. The board means the Vermont Environmental Review Board. Capability and Development Plan means the plan prepared pursuant to section 6042 of this title and adopted pursuant to 1973 Acts and Resolves, number 85, sections 6 and 7, as amended by this Act. Development means each of the following. Page 6. Do you want me to read through all of them, or do you want me to just skip to the next part of it? Um, <coughs> you should read through these. Sure. Development means each of the following. The construction of improvements on a tract or tracts of land owned or controlled by a person involving more than 10, 10 acres of land within a radius of five miles of any point on any involved land for commercial or industrial purposes. The construction of improvement for commercial or industrial purposes on more than one acre of land within a municipality that 
has not adopted permanent zoning and subdivision bylaws, or has adopted permanent zoning and subdivision bylaws if the municipality in which the proposed project is located has elected by ordinance adopted under 24 BSA chapter 59 to have this jurisdiction apply. So this new language starting on line seven already exists, but it's been moved to for clarity to the other, uh, to, to be linked to that other section right there. So it's actually immediately below um, starting on line 12. Line, starting on line 10, the construction of improvements for commercial or industrial purposes on a tract or tracts of land owned or controlled by a person involving more than one acre of land within a rural or and working lands area. The construction of improvements for commercial, industrial, or residential use at or above the elevation of 2,000 feet or in a critical resource area below that elevation. Page seven. The construction of improvements for commercial or industrial purposes at an interchange area unless there is unless it is within an existing settlement. The word development does not include the construction of improvements for farming, logging, or forestry purposes below the elevation of 2,000 feet, except when located in a critical resource area. The construction of improvements for commercial or industrial purposes within an area that has obtained an enhanced designation pursuant to 24 BSA Chapter 76A. The construction of improvements below the elevation of 2,000 feet for the on-site storage, preparation, and sale of compost, provided that one of the following apply. So starting on line 18, we've struck the existing definition of floodway and replaced it at the top of page eight with flood hazard area, which has the same meaning as under section 752 of this title, which matches the federal definition of flood hazard area. River, uh, the definition of floodway fringe has been struck and has been replaced by river corridor, which has the same meaning as under section 752 of this title, again matching the federal definition, which is um, in order to bring these definitions more up to date. Uh, number 12, necessary wildlife habitat means concentrated habitat that is identified and is demonstrated as being decisive to the survival of a species of wildlife at any period of its life, including breeding and migratory periods. 19, subdivision means each of the following. A tract or tracts of land owned or controlled by a person located outside of an area that has received an enhanced designation under 24 BSA Chapter 76A that the person has partitioned or divided for the purpose of resale into 10 or more lots within a, a radius of five miles of any point on any lot or within the jurisdictional area of the same district commission within any continuous period of five years. Question, Madam Chair. Yes. Um, and, I, and I felt like I should ask it earlier, but this works. Could you quickly tell us 24 PSA Chapter 76? Sure. It's the it's the state designation um, program, so it encompasses uh, the downtown districts uh, as well as the village center, the designated village centers. It's got all five of them in yep, there. Yep. Yep. Good. Thank you. Uh, line 19, in determining the number of lots, a lot shall be counted if any portion is outside such an area and within five miles or within the jurisdictional area of the same district commission. Page nine, 
a tract or tracts of land owned or controlled by a person that the person has partitioned or divided for the purpose of resale into six or more lots within a continuous period of five years in a, in a municipality that does not have duly adopted permanent zoning and subdivision bylaws. A tract or tracts of land owned or controlled by a person that the person has partitioned or divided for the purpose of resale into a number of lots within a continuous period of five years in a rural and working lands area. Uh, this is the first fill in the blank number we will need. There are a couple of more, um, but just something to start thinking about. A tract or tracts of land owned or controlled by a person that has been partitioned or divided for the purpose of resale into five or more separate parcels of any size within a radius of five miles of any point on any such parcel and within any period of 10 years by public auction. In this subdivision, public auction means any auction advertised or publicized in any manner or to which there is more than 10 or to which more than 10 persons have been invited. If sales under this subdivision are of interest that, when sold by means other than public auction, are exempt from the provisions of this chapter, under the provisions of subsection 6081B of this title, the fact that these interests are sold by means of a public auction shall not in itself create a requirement for a permit under this chapter. Page 10. tract or tracts of land owned or controlled by a person located in a critical resource area that has been partitioned or divided for the purpose of resale. The word subdivision shall not include each of the following. A lot, uh, a lot or lots created for the purpose, purpose of conveyance to the state or to a qualified organization as defined under 6301A of this title if the land to be transferred includes and will preserve a segment of the log trail. A lot or lots created for the purpose of conveyance to the state to a qualified holder of conservation rights and interests as defined in 821 of this title. <coughs> Connecting habitat refers to land or water or both that links patches of habitat within a landscape allowing the movement, migration, and dispersal of animals and plants, and the functioning of ecological processes. The connecting habitat may include recreational trails and improvements constructed for farming, logging, or forestry purposes. Forest block means a contiguous area of forest in any stage of succession and not currently developed for non-forest use. A forest block may include recreational trails wetlands, or other natural features that do not themselves possess tree cover and improvements constructed for farming, logging, or forestry purposes. Page 11, fragmentation means the division or conversion of a forest block or connecting habitat by the separation of a parcel into two or more parcels. The construction, conversion, relocation, or enlargement of any building or other structure, or of any mining, excavation, or landfill, and any change in use of any building or other structure, or land, or extension of use of land. However, fragmentation does not include the division or conversion of a forest block or connecting habitat by a recreational trail, or by improvements constructed for farming, logging, or forestry purposes below the elevation of 2,000 feet. Habitat means the physical and biological environment in which a particular species of plant or animal lives. As used in subdivisions 38, 39, and 41 of this section, recreational trail <coughs> means a corridor that is not paved and that is used for recreational purposes, including hiking, walking, bicycling, cross-country skiing, snowmobiling, all-terrain vehicle riding, and horseback riding. Air contaminant has the same meaning as under section 
552 of this title. Commercial purpose means the provision of facilities, goods, or services by a person other than for a municipal or state purpose to others in exchange for payment of a purchase price, fee, contribution, donation, or other object or service having value regardless of whether the payment is essential to sustain the provisions of the facilities, goods, or services. 45, critical resource area means a, a river corridor, a significant wetland as defined under section 902 of this title, land at or above 2,000 feet, and land characterized by slopes greater than 15% and shallow depth to bedrock. <coughs> Greenhouse gas <coughs> means carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, hydrofluorocarbons, perfluorocarbons, sulfur hexafluoride, and any other chemical or physical substance that is emitted into the air and that the Secretary of Natural Resources or district commission regularly anticipates to cause or contribute to climate change. <clears throat> interchange area means the land within a 3,000 foot radius of an interstate interchange, except for land within an existing settlement. The radius shall be measured from the midpoint of the interconnecting roadways within the interchange. Rural and working lands area means an area that is not an, not an existing settlement or a critical resource <coughs> area. Technical determination means a decision that results from the application of science, engineering, or other similar expertise to the facts to determine whether activity for which a permit is requested <coughs> meets the standards for issuing the permit under statute or, and rule. The term does not include an interpretation of a statute or rule. Okay. <clears throat> Page 13, line 3, section 6001E, commercial composting facility, circumvention. Notwithstanding subdivisions 6003D71 to 4 of this title, a permit under this chapter may be required for the construction of improvements below the elevation of 2,000 feet for the on-site storage, preparation, and sale of compost if the chair of the district commission, based on the information available to the chair, determines that the action has been taken to circumvent the requirements of this chapter. Helen? Yes. Can you uh, remind the committee what notwithstanding means? Although, uh, in spite of so does this supersede those, or do they take precedent over them, this? So this is an, an odd section in that it's one of, the section is, was added to avoid, to, there was concern that people were circumventing Act 250 on purpose um, under the, compo by installing compost. So um, this is just trying to say that um, if there is suspicion that there was action taken to circumvent Act 250, uh, uh, construction of improvements that would normally be exempt are um, under Act 250. They're still, they're still exempt. It's just if they think you're circumventing Act 250 on purpose, they are not exempt. But it's a very specific um, provision related to compost. May I ask a question also? Sure, this is Carol um, Woody. I'm what wondering. is the significance of 2,500 versus 2,000 feet? All, 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 I see it many times, and I don't, I don't understand that part. Right, so we, um, Carol, at the beginning of this, we, we were sort of going to just try to let Ellen get through and not oh, sorry. <clears throat> just experience the whole bill at once and then, and then get into that. But I can say that in our commission conversations, there was a lot of discussion about bridge lines and how to protect them and that is um, one of the things that our committee is going to talk about. So that is the proposed change in elevation. 
did I answer your question? No, not really. I okay. wasn't worried about what the section was trying to do. I wanted people in the room to understand what notwithstanding means when it comes up in the bill, because it doesn't make any sense to me, and so I figure there may be other people that need to be reminded. So 6001-3D lists the things that are not considered development, and under that, composting is generally not considered development. So in spite of that provision, if you're found to be circumventing Act 250, uh, it is considered development, and you can't escape. Got it. So in spite of. In spite of, yeah. Sorry. It's a, not a great word, and we do try to avoid it. Yeah. Oh, I love it. You love it? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Um, <clears throat> Subchapter 2, Section 6021. Board vacancy removal establishment. The Vermont <laughs> Environmental Review Board is created. The board shall consist of a chair and others <laughs> <laughs> to be determined. The chair members and alternate members shall be appointed by the governor with the advice and consent of the Senate. I know there's a the missing in that sentence. I will fix it. In making these appointments, the candidates, sh candidates shall be sought who have experience, expertise, or skills relating to the environment or land use. Down on line 15, initial appointments to the board shall be made so that the terms of the chair and the members expire in a staggered manner, and the length of these ter initial terms shall be determined. Terms, vacancy, succession. The terms of each appointment subsequent to the initial appointments described in subdivision A2 of this section shall be determined uh, number of years. Any appointment to fill a vacancy shall be for the unexpired portion of the term vacated, a member wishing to, su to succeed himself or herself in office may seek reappointment under the terms of this section. Removal. Notwithstanding the provisions of 3 VSA 2004, members shall be removed for cause only except the chair who shall serve at the pleasure of the governor. Down on line 12, use of alternates. When a member of the board is unavailable to hear a case, the chair may appoint an alternate member to hear the case. Retirement from office. When a, when a board member or alternate who hears all or a substantial part of a case retires from office before the case is completed, he or she shall remain a member of the board for the purpose of concluding and deciding that case and signing the findings and judgments involved. A retiring chair shall also remain a member for the purpose of certifying questions of law if a party appeals to the Supreme Court. Completion of a case. A case shall be deemed completed when the board enters a final decision, even though that decision is appealed to the Supreme Court and remanded by that court. Court of record jurisdiction. The board shall have the powers of a court of record in the determination and adjudication of all matters within its jurisdiction. It may initiate proceedings on any matter within its jurisdiction. It may render judgments and enforce the same by any suitable process issuable by courts in this state. An order issued by the board on any matter within its jurisdiction shall have the effect of a judicial order. The board's jurisdiction shall include the issuance of declaratory rulings on the applicability of this chapter and rules or orders issued under this chapter pursuant to 3 VSA 808 and the issuance of decisions on appeals pursuant to section 6089 and chapter 219 of this title. Hearing officers. One board member or any officer or employee of the board 
duly appointed by the chair of the board, may inquire into and examine any matter within the jurisdiction of the board. A hearing officer may hold any hearing on any matter within the jurisdiction of the board. Hearings conducted by a hearing officer shall be in accordance with 3 BSA sections 809 to 814. A hearing officer may administer oaths and exercise the powers of the board necessary to hear and determine a matter for which the officer was appointed. A hearing officer shall report his or her findings of fact in writing to the board in the form of a proposal for decision. A copy shall be served upon the parties pursuant to 3 BSA section 811. However, judgment on those findings shall be rendered only by a majority of the board. Personnel. Regular personnel. The board may appoint legal counsel, scientists, engineers, experts, investigators, temporary employees, and administrative personnel as it finds necessary in carrying out its duties in providing personnel to assist the district commissions and in investigating matters within its jurisdiction, including oversight and monitoring of permit compliance. Personnel for particular proceedings. Retention. The board may authorize or retain legal counsel, official stenographers, expert witnesses, advisors, temporary employees, and other research services to assist the board in any proceeding before it under this chapter or chapter 219 of this title and to monitor compliance with any formal, dis formal opinion of the board or a district commission. The personnel authorized by this section shall be in addition to the regular personnel of the board. The board shall fix the amount of compensation and expenses to be paid to such additional personnel. Assessment of costs. The board may allocate to an applicant the portion of its expenses incurred by retaining additional personnel for a proceeding. On petition of an applicant to which costs are proposed to be allocated, the board shall review and determine, after opportunity for hearing, the necessity and reasonableness of those costs, having due regard for the size and complexity of the project, and may amend or revise an allocation. Prior to allocating costs, the board shall make a determination of the purpose and use of the funds to be raised under this section, identify the recipient of the funds, provide for allocation of costs among applicants to be assessed, indicate an estimated duration of the proceedings, and estimate the total cost to, cost to be improved, imposed. With the approval of the board, estimates may be revised as necessary. From time to time during the progress of the work, the board shall render the applicant detailed statements showing the amount of money expended or contracted for in the work of additional personnel, which statements shall be paid into the state treasury at the time and the manner as the board may reasonably direct. All payments for costs allocated pursuant to this section shall be deposited into the fund created under section 6029 of this title. Rules. The board may adopt rules of procedure for itself and the district commissions. The board shall adopt rules of procedure that govern appeals and other contested cases before it and are consistent with this chapter and chapter 219 of this title. The board may adopt substantive rules in accordance with the provisions of 3 BSA chapter 25, which is the Administrative Procedures Act. So I have a question. This whole section is about, um, is it new, is it language that existed before the board was restructured in 2004? I, I don't know that. that interpret and carry out the provisions of this chapter. These rules shall include provisions that establish criteria under which applications or permits under this chapter may be classified in terms of complexity and significance of impact, 
under the standards of subsection 6086A of this chapter. In accordance with that classification, the rules may provide for simplified or less stringent procedures than are otherwise required under sections 6083, 6084, and 6085 of this chapter. Provide for the filing of notices instead of applications for the permits that would otherwise be required under section 6081 of this chapter. And provide a procedure by which a district commission may authorize a district coordinator to issue a permit that the district commission has determined under board rules as a minor application with no undue adverse impact. District commissioners, for the purposes of the administration of this chapter, the state is divided into nine districts. A district environmental commission is created for each district. Each district commission shall consist of three members from that district appointed in the month of February by the governor so that two appointments expire in each odd numbered year. Two of the members shall be appointed for a term of four years and the chair, third member, of each district shall be appointed for a two year term. In any district, the governor may appoint not more than four alternate members from the district whose terms shall not exceed two years, who may hear any case when a regular member is disqualified or otherwise unable to serve. Members shall be removable for cause only, except the chair, who shall serve at the pleasure of the governor. Any vacancy shall be filled by the governor for the unexpired period of the term. The chair of the board, upon request of the chair of a district commission, may appoint and assign former commission members to sit on specific commission cases when some or all of the regular members and, alternate mem and alternates of the district commission are disqualified or, are, or otherwise unable to serve. <coughs> this language also already exists elsewhere and has been moved for clarity. Paragraph E? Yes. Section 6027, Powers. The board and district commissions shall have supervisory authority and environmental matters respecting projects within their jurisdiction and shall apply their independent judgment in determining facts and interpreting law. They each shall have the power with respect to any matter in its jurisdiction to administer oaths, take depositions, subpoena and compel the attendance of witnesses and require the production of evidence. Allow parties to enter upon lands of other parties for the purposes of inspecting and investigating conditions related to the matter before the board or commission. Enter upon lands for the purpose of conducting inspections, investigations, examinations, tests, and site evaluations as it deems necessary to verify information presented in any matter within its jurisdiction and apply for and receive grants from the federal government and from other sources. The powers granted under this chapter are additional to any other powers that may be granted by other legislation. The board may designate or establish such regional offices as it deems necessary to implement the provisions of this chapter and rules adopted here under. The board may designate or require a regional planning commission to receive applications, provide administrative assistance, perform investigations, and make recommendations. At the request of a district commission, if the board chair determines that the workload of a requesting district is likely to result in unreasonable delays, or that the requesting district commission is disqualified to hear a case, the chair may authorize the district commission of another district to sit in the requesting district to consider one or more applicant applications. The board may rule, may by rule allow joint hearings to be conducted with specified state agencies or specified municipalities. The board may publish or contract or contracts to publish annotations and indices of its decisions and the decisions of the environmental division and the text of those decisions. The published product shall be available at a reasonable rate to the general public and at a reduced rate to libraries and governmental bodies within the state. 
The board shall manage the process by which land use permits are issued under, sec under section 6086 of this title, may initiate enforcement on related matters under, th under the provisions of chapters 201 and 211 of this title, and may petition the Environmental Division for revocation of land use permits under this chapter. Grounds for revocation are non-compliance with this chapter, rules adopted under this chapter, or an order that, it ha that is issued that relates to this chapter, non-compliance with any permit or permit condition, failure to disclose all relevant and material facts in the application during the permitting process, Misinterpretation of any relevant or material fact at any time. Misrepresentation. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, at any time. Fail, uh, line 10, failure to pay a penalty or other sums owed pursuant to or other failure to comply with court order, stipulation agreement, schedule of compliance, or other order issued under Vermont statutes and related to permit. Or... Failure to provide certification of construction costs as required under subsection 6083 AA of this title, or failure to pay supplemental fees as required under that section. The board may hear appeals of fee refund requests under section 6083A of this title. The chair, subject to the direction of the board, shall have general charge of the offices and employees of the board and the offices and employees of the district commissions. The board may participate as a party in all matters before the environmental division that relate to land use permits issued under this chapter. Yeah, so I was hoping to better understand why we've changed the NRB. I'm, I'm not seeing the, the overriding of what's going on here. Pardon? When you say changed, you mean we, we changed putting the comment? I don't really know what I mean, except that we've changed it from, so I got, I got, I got to go back, I guess, to the very beginning where we, 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 we changed almost the very beginning. Placing the Natural Resources Board with the Vermont Environmental Review Board, which is now the board. And so, what's the 10,000 foot implication yeah. of that? So, uh, one of the proposals from the commission is to uh, change the board to a quasi judicial board that will hear appeals which are currently being heard by the Environmental Division of the Superior Court. So um, the change is intertwined throughout this bill, but there is sections later in um, the bill where we um, talk about the makeup of the board and its um, ability to hear permit appeals. I know it's it's difficult because we're we're making changes throughout yeah. that that will lead, that will lead to one idea. Thank you very much. And the name is changed for really just to kind of indicate that. Yes, for sure. So you're, you're doing away with the environmental board? So currently there's the Natural Resources Board um, and the Environmental Division of the Superior Court. Um, we're taking away the permit appeals from the, from the Environmental Division of the Court. They will retain some of their jurisdiction over other matters, but we're taking that appeals and bringing it to what is currently the Natural Resources Board and giving them some extra power. Oh, Building a bigger bureaucracy. Well, we're going back. Just to more the jobs, more. Are we, are we building <laughs> more jobs way. for state government, or what? What are we doing? It's the way that the appeal structure was done before 2004. Going back to that, based on feedback we got from the public. Okay. Okay. Uh, section 6028. Compensation. 
members of the board and district commissions shall receive per DMK of $100 and all necessary and actual expenses. Section 6030, Capability and Development Maps. Updates. On or before January 1, 2021, the Board and the Secretaries of Commerce and Community Development, of Digital Services, of Agriculture, Food and Markets, and of Natural Resources shall complete an update to the capability and development maps created under this chapter in 1971 for reference in applying this chapter. Maps updated pursuant to this section shall be consistent with the capability and development plan and shall include and identify environmental constraints, existing settlements, rural and working lands areas, critical resource areas, facilities and infrastructure, and areas targeted for conservation, public investment, and development. The board and, the, and these secretaries shall complete further updates to these maps no less frequently than every eight years. The board shall lead and, com and coordinate the completion of updates pursuant to this section. Process. When updating maps pursuant to this section, the board and secretaries shall, prior to completing the update, consult with the regional planning commissions and issue a draft update provide public notice of the draft update, and offer an opportunity for written public comment, and conduct one or, more, one or more public meetings to receive oral comment on the draft update. Availability. The updated maps shall be maintained as a layer in the Agency of Natural Resources, Natural Resources Atlas, and shall be available to the public. Ethical standards. The chair and the regular and alternate members of the board and the chair and the regular and alternate members of each district commission shall comply with the following ethical standards. The provisions of 12 BSA section 61, disqualification for interest. The chair and each member shall conduct the affairs of his or her office in such a manner as to instill public trust and confidence and shall take all reasonable steps to avoid any action or circumstance that might result in any one of the following. Undermining his or her independence or impartiality of action. Taking official action on the basis of unfair considerations. Giving preferential treatment to any private interest on the basis of unfair considerations. Giving preferential treatment to any family member or member of his or her household using his or her office for the advancement of personal interest or secure or to secure special privileges or exemptions or adversely affecting the confidence of the public in the integrity of the board or district commission in the case of the board no person who receives or has received during the previous two years a significant portion of his or her income directly or indirectly from permit holders or applicants for a permit under chapter 47 of this title may hear appeals from acts or decisions of the secretary related to permits issued under chapter 47 which is the water pollution control chapter of title 10. Uh, section 6081 permits required exemptions Subsection A of this section shall not apply <coughs> to a subdivision exempt under the regulations of the Department of Health in effect on January 21, 1970, or any subdivision which has a permit issued prior to June 1, 1970 under the Board of Health regulations, or has a pending, or has pending a bona fide application for a permit under the regulations of the Board of Health on June 1, 1970, with respect to plats on file as of June 1, 1970, provided such permit is granted prior to August 1, 1970. Subsection A of this section shall not apply to development, which is not also a subdivision, which has been commenced prior to June 1, 1970, if the construction will be completed by March 1, 1971. Subsection A of this section shall not 
apply to a state highway on which a hearing pursuant to 19 BSA 222 has been held prior to June 1, 1970. Subsection A of this section shall not apply to any telecommunications facility in existence prior to July 1, 1997 unless that facility is in development as defined in subdivision 6001.3 of this title. Subsection A of this section shall not apply to any substantial change in such accepted subdivision or development. On or before July 1, 2020, owning, owners of pre-existing pits and quarries shall submit extraction, extraction data to the board in order to establish a baseline against which substantial changes may be determined. Do you have a typo that you caught from? Well, I, I, going back to line 14, subsection A of this section, the way you read it said shall not apply, but is it supposed to be shall apply or shall not apply? To line 15 of this section shall, the way you read it said not apply. Oh, I'm sorry. Should it be apply or not apply? Apply. Okay. We are not changing that sentence. Okay. Sorry. All right. Um, uh, subsection J is being repealed on to page 28. With respect to the commercial extraction from slate of slate from a slate quarry activities. Activities that are not ancillary to, to slate mining operations may constitute substantial changes and may be subject to permitting requirements under this chapter. Ancillary activities include the following activities that pertain to slate and that take place within a registered parcel that contain a slate quarry. Drilling, crushing, grinding, sizing, washing, drying, sawing, and cutting stone. Blasting, trimming, punching, splitting, and gouging. Gauging? Gouging. Gauging. Gauging. <laughs> and use of buildings and use of construction of equipment exclusively to carry out such activities. Buildings that existed on April 1, 1995 or any replacement to those buildings shall be considered ancillary. Activities that are ancillary activities that involve crushing may constitute substantial changes if they may result in significant impact with respect to any of the criteria specified in subdivisions 6086A1 through 10 of this title. By no later than January 1st, 1997, any owner of land or mineral rights or any owner of slate quarry leasehold rights on a parcel of land on which a slate quarry was located as of June 1st, 1970, may register the existence of the slate quarry with the district commission and with the clerk of the municipality in which the slate quarry is located, while also providing each with a map which indicates the boundaries of the parcel which contains the slate quarry. Which contains it. Slate quarry registration shall state the name and address of the owner of the land, mineral rights, and leasehold rights, whether that person holds mineral rights or leasehold rights, or is the owner in fee symbol, the physical location of the same, the physical location and size of ancillary buildings, and the book and page of the recorded deed or other instrument by which the owner holds title to the land or rights. Slate quarry registration documents shall be submitted to the district commission together with a request under the provisions of, of subsection 6007C of this title for a final determination regarding the applicability of this chapter. The final determination regarding a slate quarry registration under subsection 6007C of this title shall be recorded in the municipal land records at the expense of the registrant, along with an accurate site plan of the parcel depicting the specific, the site specific information contained in the registration document. The registrant must provide notice of the slate quarry's registration to the adjacent landowners. With respect to a slate quarry located on a particular registered parcel of land, ancillary activities on the parcel related to the extraction, 
and processing of slate into products that are primarily other than crushed stone products shall not be deemed to be substantial changes as long as the activities do not involve the creation of one or more new slate quarry holes that are not related to an existing slate quarry hole. Registered slate quarries shall be added to the Agency of Natural Resources res Natural Resource Atlas. Section 6083A, Act 250 Fees. A written request for an application fee refund shall be submitted to the district commission to which the fee was paid within 90 days of the withdrawal of the application. District commission decisions regarding the application fee refunds may be appealed to the board in accordance with board rules. A commission or the board may require any permittee to file a certification of actual construction costs and may direct the payment of a supplemental fee in the event that an application understated the project's construction costs. Failure to file a certification or to pay a supplemental fee shall be grounds for permit revocation. Section 6085, hearings, party status. The board and any district commission acting through one or more duly authorized representatives at any pre-hearing conference or at any other times deemed appropriate by the board or by the district commission shall promote expeditious, informal, ex expeditious and informal non-adversarial resolution of issues, require the timely exchange of information concerning the application, and encourage participants to settle differences. No district commissioner who is participating as a decision maker in a particular case may act as a duly authorized representative for the purposes of this subsection. These efforts at dispute resolution shall not affect the burden of proof on issues before a commission or the board, nor shall they affect the requirement that a permit may be issued only after the issuance of affirmative findings under the criteria established in, se in section 6086 of this title. Um, yes. I'm wondering if it would be a good time to give you a break. Oh. Are you for about an hour? <laughs> <laughs> How about we take uh, I'm pretty good. I don't know. That's what she said. Five to seven minute break. There we go. <laughs> oh, quickie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> never Every voice or rest. It'll give you some of the script. It's probably zipping around the room. Chris sit out this way. It's an interesting card. Yeah, he's dead. He's dead. He's Change. 
A permit will be granted whenever it is demonstrated by the applicant that, in addition to all other applicable criteria, the construction, use, operation, and maintenance of the development or subdivision will avoid the emission of greenhouse gases, including greenhouse gases from the vehicular traffic to be generated by the development or subdivision. If it is not feasible to avoid such emissions, will minimize them. Or, if it is not feasible to avoid or minimize such emissions, will mitigate them in accordance with rules adopted by the board. Any offsets used shall be third party verified and enforceable by the applicant and its successors and assigns and by the state of Vermont. The rule shall be adopted in, a, in consultation with the Secretary of Natural Resources and shall comply with the greenhouse gas reduction goals of section 578 of this title. The development or subdivision will employ design and materials that are sufficient to enable the improvements to be constructed, including buildings, roads, and other infrastructure to withstand and adapt to the effects of climate change, including extreme temperature events reasonably projected at the time of application. Two, water pollution will not result in undue water pollution. In making this determination, the District Commission shall at least consider the elevation of land above sea level and in relation to the floodplains, the nature of soils, subsoils, and their abilities, and their ability to adequately support waste disposal, the slope of the land, and its effect on effluence, the availability of streams for disposal of effluence, and the applicable health and environmental conservation department regulations. Headwaters. A permit will be granted whenever it is demonstrated by the applicant that, in addition to all other applicable criteria, the development or subdivision will not meet, will meet any applicable health and environmental conservation department regulation regarding reduction of the quality of the ground or surface waters flowing through or upon lands that are not devoted to intensive development and, la and which lands are headwaters of watersheds characterized by steep, steep slopes and shallow soils or drainage areas of 20 square miles or less or above 1500 feet elevation or watersheds of public water supplies designated by the Agency of Natural Resources, or areas supplying significant amounts of recharged waters to aquifers. Waste disposal. A permit will be granted whenever it is demonstrated by the applicant that, in addition to all other applicable criteria, the development or subdivision will meet any applicable health and environmental conservation department regulations, regarding the disposal of wastes and will not involve the injection of waste materials or any harmful or toxic substances into groundwater or wells. Water conservation. A permit will be granted whenever it is demonstrated by the applicant that, in addition to all other applicable criteria, the design has considered water conservation incorporates multiple use or recycling where technically and economically practical, practical, utilizes the best available technology for such applications, and provides for continued efficient operation of these systems. Flood hazard areas, river corridors. A permit will be granted whenever it is demonstrated by the applicant that, in addition to all other applicable criteria, the development of a, the, the development or subdivision of lands within a flood hazard area or river corridor will not restrict or di divert the flow of flood waters, cause or contribute to fluvial erosion, and endanger the health, safety, and welfare of the public or of riparian owners during flooding. Streams. A permit will be granted whenever it is demonstrated by the applicant that in addition to all other applicable criteria, the development or subdivision of lands 
on or adjacent to the banks of a stream will, whenever feasible, maintain the natural condition of the stream and will not endanger the health, safety, or welfare of the public or of adjoining landowners. Shorelines. A permit will be granted whenever it is demonstrated by the applicant that, in addition to all other applicable, in addition to all other criteria, the development or subdivision of shorelines must, of necessity, be located on a shoreline in order to fulfill the purpose of the development or subdivision. And the development or subdivision will, insofar as possible and reasonable in light of its purpose, retain the shoreline and the waters in their natural condition, allow continued access to the waters and the recreational opportunities provided by the waters, retain or provide vegetation that screen the development or subdivision from the waters, and stabilize the bank from erosion as necessary with vegetation cover. Wetlands. A permit will be granted whenever it is demonstrated by the applicant, in addition to all, in addition to other criteria, that the development or subdivision will not violate the rules of the Na Secretary of Natural Resources as adopted under Chapter 37 of this title relating to significant wetlands. Three, water supply. Does have sufficient water available for the reasonably foreseeable needs of the subdivision or development? Will not cause an unreasonable burden on an existing water supply if one is to be utilized. Transportation will not cause unreasonable congestion or unsafe conditions with respect to the use of highways, waterways, railways, airports and airways, bicycle, pedestrian, and other tr transit infrastructure, and other means of transportation existing or proposed. Will incorporate transportation demand management strategies and provide safe access and connections to adjacent lands and facilities and to existing and planned pedestrian, bicycle, and transit networks and services. However, the district commission may decline to require such a strategy, access, or connection if it finds that a reasonable, per reasonable person would not undertake the measure given the type, scale, and transportation impacts of the proposed development or subdivision. Eight, ecosystem protection, scenic beauty, historic sites. Will not have an undue adverse effect on the scenic or natural beauty of the area, aesthetics, historic sites, or rare and irreplaceable natural areas. Necessary wildlife habitat and endangered species. A permit will not be granted unless it is demonstrated by the applicant that a development or subdivision will not destroy or significantly imperil necessary wildlife habitat or any endangered species, or if such destruction or impairment will occur, the economic, social, cultural, recreational, or other benefit to the public from the development or subdivision will outweigh the economic, environmental, or recreational loss to the public from the destruction or impairment of the habitat or species. All feasible and reasonable means of preventing or lessening the destruction, diminution, or impairment of the habitat or species have been or will not continue to be applied, or a reasonably acceptable alternative site is not owned or controlled by the applicant that would allow the development or subdivision to fulfill its intended purpose. Forest blocks. A permit will not be granted for a development or subdivision within or partially within a forest block unless the applicant demonstrates that the development or subdivision will avoid fragmentation of the forest block through the design of the project or the location of project improvements or both. If it is not feasible to avoid fragmentation of the forest block and the design of the development or subdivision minimizes fragmentation of the forest 
of the force block, or it is not feasible to avoid or minimize fragmentation of the force block, and the applicant will mitigate the fragmentation in accordance with section 6094 of this title. Methods for avoiding or minimizing the fragmentation of a forest block may include locating buildings and, and other improvements and operating the project in a manner that avoids or minimizes incur incursion into and disturbance of the forest block, including clustering of buildings and associated improvements. Designing roads, driveways, and utilities that serve the development or subdivision to avoid or minimize fragmentation of the forest block. Such design may be accomplished by following or sharing existing features on the land, such as roads, tree lines, stone walls, and fence lines. Connecting habitat. A permit will not be granted for a development or subdivision unless the applicant demonstrates that. The development or subdivision will avoid fragmentation of a connecting habitat through the design of the project or the location of project improvements or both. It is not feasible to avoid fragmentation, fragmentation of the connecting habitat and the design of the development or subdivision minimizes fragmentation of the connector. Or it is not feasible to avoid or minimize fragmentation of the connecting habitat and the applicant will mitigate the fragmentation in accordance with section 6094 of this title. Methods for avoiding or minimizing the fragmentation of a connecting habitat may include locating buildings and other improvements at the farthest feasible location from the center of the connector, designing the location of buildings and other improvements to leave the greatest conti contiguous portion of the area undisturbed in order to facilitate wildlife travel through the connector, or when there is no feasible site for construction of buildings and other improvements outside the connector, designing buildings, designing the buildings and improvements to facilitate the continued viability of the connector for use by the wildlife. Nine, capability and development plan. In accordance with the duly adopted capability and development plan and land use plan when is in accordance with a duly adopted capability and development plan and land use plan when adopted. Representative Dolan has a question. Just a quick question. Um, the definition of connector, does that go back to connecting habitat or do we have a separate definition of connector? Uh, yes, but uh, I, yes. I believe it is to refer to connecting habitat that I highlighted that it may maybe we should use a different word for continuity, but especially if that was a confusing point. Nine uh, F, energy conservation and efficiency. A permit will be granted when it has been demonstrated by the applicant that, in addition to all other applicable criteria. The planning and design of the subdivision or development reflect the principles of energy conservation and energy efficiency, including reduction of greenhouse gas emissions from the use of energy, and incorporate the best available technology for efficient use or recovery of energy. An applicant seeking an affirmative finding under this criterion shall provide evidence that the subdivision or development complies with the applicable building energy standards and stretch codes under 30 BSA section 51 or 53. 9I, interchange areas. A permit will be granted for a development or subdivision within an interchange area when it is demonstrated that, in addition to all other applicable criteria, the development or subdivision complies with the Vermont Interstate Interchange Planning and Design, gu design Guidelines applicable the category of land use as identified for that area in the regional plan. As used in this subdivision I, Vermont Interstate Interchange Planning and Design Guidelines refers to the guidelines by that name published by the Agency of Commerce and Community Development 
in 2004, or such update to those guidelines as the Commissioner of Housing and Community Development may subsequently publish, provided that the update is at least as protective of existing settlements, scenic beauty and aesthetics, farmland and natural resources as the 2004 guidelines. 9K, development affecting public investments. A permit will be granted for the development or subdivision of lands adjacent to governmental, governmental and public utility facilities, services, and lands, including highways, airports, waste disposal facilities, <coughs> office and maintenance buildings, fire and police stations, universities, schools, hospitals, prisons, jails, electric generating and transmission facilities, oil and gas pipelines, parks, hiking trails, forests, and game lands, lands conserved under chapter 155 of this title, and facilities or lands receiving benefits through the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board under chapter 15 of this title, the state designation program under, cha under 24 BSA chapter 76A, or the Vermont Downtown and Village Center Tax Credit Program under 32 VSA Chapter 151, Subchapter 11J, when it is demonstrated that, in addition to all other applicable criteria, the development or subdivision will not unnecessarily or unreasonably endanger the public or quasi-public investment in the facility, service, or lands, or materially jeopardize or interfere with the function, efficiency, or safety of, or the public's use or enjoyment of, or access to the facility, service, or lands. <laughs> 10, local and regional plans is in conformance with any duly adopted local plan that has been approved under 24 BSA section 4350 regional plan that has been approved by the board under 24 BSA 4348, or capital program under 24 BSA section 4430. In making this finding, a district commission shall require conformance with the future land use maps contained in the local and regional plans and with the written provisions of those plans. A district commission shall decline to apply a provision of a local or regional plan only if the commission is persuaded that the provision does not afford a person of ordinary intelligence with a reasonable opportunity to understand that the provision to understand what the provision directs requires or prescribes if the district commission finds applicable provisions of the town plan to be ambiguous the district commission for interpretive purposes shall consider bylaws, but only to the extent that they implement and are consistent <coughs> with those provisions and need not consider any other evidence. Quick question. Yeah. Is what is proscribes? Or is it supposed to be prescribed? At line 15. So I am not entirely certain, but I think that that language is directly from a Supreme Court case on the subject. I've just never heard the word proscribed. But, okay. mm -hmm. it's coming forward. Oh, it means forbid. Mm -hmm. That's what it means? According to Google. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty true. <laughs> and and a, an attorney in the room is nodding yes. <laughs> Which one though? <laughs> <laughs> Two yes, one no. <laughs> within the respect to subdivisions A1 through 10 
of this section, including those set forth in 24 BSA sections 44424, 4424A2, 4414D1, 4463B, and 4464. The dedication of lands for public use and the filing of bonds to ensure compliance. <coughs> the re requirements and conditions incorporated from Title, ti from Title 24 may be applied whether or not a local plan has been adopted. General requirements and conditions may be established by rule of the board. Other permits and approvals, presumptions. The, the board may, by rule, allow the acceptance of a permit or permits or approval of any state agency with respect to subdivisions A1 through 5 of this section or a permit or permits of a specified municipal government with respect to subdivisions A1 through 7 and 9 and 10 of this section or a combination of such permits and approval approvals in lieu of evidence by the applicant. The acceptance of such approval, permit, or permits shall create a presumption that the applicant that the application is not detrimental to the public health and welfare with respect to the specific requirements for which it is accepted. Such a rule may be revoked or amended pursuant to the procedures set forth in the Vermont Administrative, Administrative Procedures Act, Procedure Act. The rules adopted by the board shall not approve the acceptance of a permit or approval of such any of such an agency or per, or a permit of a municipal government unless each of the following applies. The permit or approval satisfies the appropriate requirements of subsection A of this section. The board finds that the permit or approval is part of a program that reliably meets its goals, such as achieving water quality <coughs> standards. A presumption created under this subsection may be rebutted by the introduction of evidence contrary to the presumed fact. In the case of approvals and permits issued by the Agency of Natural Resources, there shall be no presumption for a permit or approval authorizing the discharge of a pollutant into water if uses of that water are already impaired by the pollutant. Admissible evidence of the technical determinations of the agency shall be accorded substantial deference by the district commissions. This next section, starting on line 10, is the language that was on the previous page that was struck. So it's been moved for clarity. Thank you. A district commission, in accordance with rules adopted by the board, shall accept determinations issued by a, de a development review board under the provisions of 24 BSA 4420 with respect to local review of the municipal impacts under criteria of this section. The, accept the acceptance of such a de determination, if positive, shall create a presumption that the application is not detrimental to the public health and welfare with respect to the specific requirement for which it is accepted, and if negative, shall create a presumption that the application is so detrimental. Any determinations, positive or negative, under the provisions of 24 BSA section 4420 shall create presumptions only to the extent that the impacts under the criteria are limited to the municipality issue, issuing the decision. <coughs> Uh, 6087, denial of application. A permit may not be denied solely for the reasons set forth in subdivision 6086, A5, 6, and 7 of this title. Reasonable conditions and requirements allowable in subsection 6086, C of this title may be attached to alleviate the burdens created. However, a permit may be denied under subdivision 
86A5 of this title if the permit is for development in an interchange area that is not within an existing settlement. 6088, burden of proof, production, and persuasion. The initial burden of production to produce sufficient evidence for a district commission to make a factual determination shall be on the applicant with respect to subdivisions 6086-1 through 10 of this title. The burden of persuasion shall be on the applicant with respect to subdivisions 86A1, 2, 3, 4, 8, A through C, 9, and 10 of this title to show that the application meets the relevant standard. The burden shall be on any party opposing the application with respect to subdivisions 86, 6086A5, 6, 7, exception 8A through AC of this title to show that the application does not meet the relevant standard. Page 48, 6089, Appeals. Appeals of any act or decision of a district commission under this chapter or any district coordinator under subsection 6007C of this title shall be made <laughs> to the Environmental Division in accordance with chapter 220 of this title. For purposes of this section, a decision of the chair of a district commission under section 6001E of this title on whether action has been taken to circumvent the requirements of this chapter shall be considered an act or decision of the district commission. In an appeal of an act or decision described in subsection A of this section, an applicant shall have the burden of proof on the issues raised in his or her appeal in his or her appeal. The applicant, whether or not an appellant, shall have a burden to produce evidence sufficient to inform the division of the nature, elements, context, and impacts of the project to which the appeal relates. Section 6090, 6 recording of uh, duration of permits. Recording. In order to afford adequate notice of the terms and conditions of land use permits, permit amendments, and revocation of permits, they shall be recorded in local land records. Recordings under this chapter shall be indexed as though the, permit the permittee were the grantor of a deed. Permits for a specified period. Any permit granted under this section for extraction of mineral resources operation of solid waste disposal facilities or logging above 2,500 feet shall be for a specified period determined by the board in accordance with the rules adopted under this chapter as a reasonable projection of the time during which the land will remain suitable for use if developed or subdivided as contemplated in the application and with due regard for the economic considerations attending the proposed development or subdivision. Other permits issued under this chapter shall be for an indefinite time term as long as there is compliance with the conditions of the permit. Expiration dates contained in permits issued before July 1st, 1994 involving developments that are not for extraction of mineral resources operation of solid waste disposal facilities or logging above 2,000 feet are extended for an indefinite term as long as there is compliance with the conditions of the permits. Change to non-jurisdictional use, release from permit. On application signed by each permittee, the district commission may release land subject to a permit under this chapter from the obligations of that permit and the obligation to obtain amendments to the permit on finding of each of the following. The use of the land as of the date of the application is not the same as the use of the land that caused the obligation to obtain a permit under this chapter. 
the use of the land as of the date of the application does not constitute development or subdivision as defined in section 6001 of this title and would not require a permit or permit amendment but for the fact the land is already subject to a permit under this chapter. The permittee or permittees are in compliance with the permit and their obligations under this chapter. It shall be a condition of each affirmative decision under this subsection that a subsequent proposal of development or subdivision on the land to which the decision applies shall be subject to this chapter as if the land had never previously received a permit under this chapter. An application for a decision under this subsection, subsection shall be made on a form prescribed by the board. The form shall require evidence demonstrating that the application complies with subdivisions 1A through C of this subsection. The application shall be processed in, a, in the manner described in, su, in section 6084 of this title and may be treated as a minor application under that section. In determining whether to treat as a minor, as minor an as minor, as minor an application under this section, the district commission shall apply the criteria of this subsection and not of subsection 6086A of this title. Section 6094, mitigation of forest blocks and connecting habitat. A district commission may consider a proposal to mitigate through compensation the fragmentation of a forest block or connecting habitat if the applicant demonstrates that it is not feasible to avoid or minimize fragmentation of the block or connector in accordance with the respective requirements of subdivision 6086A, 8B, or C of this title. A district commission may approve the proposal only if it finds that the proposal will meet the requirements of the rules adopted under this section and will preserve a forest block or connecting habitat of similar quality and character to the forest block or connector affected by the development or subdivision. The board in consultation with the Secretary of Natural Resources shall adopt rules governing mitigation under this section. The rules shall state, that the, shall state the acreage ratio of forest block or connecting habitat to be preserved in relation to the block or connector affected by the development or subdivision. Compensation measures to be allowed under the rules shall be based on the, on the ratio of land developed pursuant to subdivision one of this subsection and shall include preservation of a forest block or connecting habitat of similar quality and character to the block or connector that the development or subdivision will affect. Deposit of an off-site mitigation fee into the Vermont Housing and Conservation Trust Fund under section 312 of this title. This mitigation fee shall be derived as follows. Determine the number of acres of forest block or connecting habitat or both affected by the proposed development or subdivision. Multiply this number of affected acres by the ratio set forth in the rules. Multiply the resulting product by a price per acre value, which shall be based on the amount that the Commissioner of Forest, Parks, and Recreation determines to be the recent per acre cost to acquire conservation easements for forest blocks and connecting habitat of similar quality and character in the same geographic region as the proposed development or subdivision. The Vermont Housing and Conservation Board shall, shall use such a fee to preserve in the adjacent geographic area a forest block or connecting habitat of similar quality and character to the block or connector affected by the development or subdivision. Such other compensation measures as the rules may authorize. The mitigation of impact the mitigation of impact on a forest block or a connecting habitat or both 
shall be structured also to mitigate the impacts under the criteria of subsection 6086A of this title, other than subdivisions 8, B, and C, to land or resources within the block or connector. All forest blocks and connecting habitat preserved by preserved pursuant to this section shall be protected by permanent easement conservation. permanent conservation easements that grant development rights and include conservation restrictions and are conveyed to a qualified holder as defined in section 821 of this title with the ability to monitor and enforce easements in perpetuity. <clears throat> Resource mapping forest blocks. 10 BSA section 127 is amended to read. So, so we're out of the Act 250 chapter now, and the rest of the changes will be to other sections and titles. Resource mapping. The Secretary of Natural Resources, the Secretary, shall complete and maintain resource mapping based on the Geographic Information System, GIS, or other technology. The mapping shall identify natural resources throughout the state, including forest blocks, that may be relevant to the consideration of energy projects and projects subject to Chapter 151 of this title. The Center for Geographic Information shall be available to provide assistance to the Secretary in carrying out the resource mapping. Yes. So we made a statement, we're now out of the Act 50 arena and into other areas. Is the intent to bring these other areas into the new Act 250? Um, I mostly just meant we were out of the, the amendments to the actual statute. All of these things are, thank you, are in. I should have let you finish your sentence. Are related to Act 250 and its prophecies. For example, those forest blocks map, forest blocked, forest block maps <coughs> will be relevant to the forest block um, mitigation and criteria. Okay. The secretary shall consider resource maps developed under this sub subsection A of this section when providing evidence and recommendations to the Public Utility Commission under 30 DSA. Section 248B5, and when, and when commenting on or providing recommendations under Chapter 151 of this title to district commissions on other projects. Chapter 151 is the Act 250 chapter, by the way. The Secretary shall establish and maintain written procedures that include a process and science based criteria for updating resource maps developed under subsection A of this section. Before establishing or revising these procedures, the Secretary shall provide opportunities for protected parties and the public to submit relevant information and recommendations. Section 5, Enhanced Designation Appeal. 24 VSA Section 2793F is added to read Enhanced Designation. A municipality that has received or applies for designation of a downtown development district, village center, new town center, or growth center under this chapter may also apply for an enhanced designation pursuant to this section, pursuant uh, to this section in order to allow the municipality in lieu of the in lieu of the district commissions under 10 BSA chapter 151. To ensure that the land, to ensure that land development within the designated area complies with the criteria set forth in 10 BSA section 6086A, as used in this section, land development has the same meaning as in section 4303 of this table. 
a municipality seeking an enhanced, de an enhanced designation shall demonstrate that its bylaws ensure that land development in the designated area complies with the criteria set forth in 10 BSA section 6086A. Demonstrate that it has the capability to review land development for compliance with those criteria and to enforce its decisions. Identify those areas within the municipality that constitute critical resource areas within the meaning of 10 BSA section 6001. Satisfy such requirements, such other requirements as the State Board shall adopt by rule. The State Board shall adopt rules to implement this section and may grant or conditionally grant an application for enhanced designation if it meets the requirements of this section and the adopted rules. Section 6, 24 BSA, Section 2798 is amended to read Designation Decisions Appeal. A person aggrieved by a designation decision of the State Board under one or more of sections 2793 through 2793F of this title may appeal to the Vermont Environmental Review Board established under 10 BSA Chapter 151 within 31 within 30 days of the decision. If the decision pertains to designation of a growth center under section 2793C of this title, the period for filing an appeal shall be told by the filing of a request for, reconsider for, reconsideration, for reconsideration under that section and shall commence to run in full on the state board's issuance of a decision on that request. The Vermont Environmental Review Board shall conduct a de novo hearing on the decision under appeal and shall proceed in accordance with the contested case requirements of the Vermont Administrative Procedure Act. The Vermont Environmental Review Board shall issue a final decision within 90 days of the filing of the appeal. The provisions of 10 BSA section 6024 regarding assistance to the Vermont Environmental Review Board from other departments and agencies of the state shall apply to appeals, appeals under this section. Regional and Municipal Planning, Section 7, 24 BSA, Section 4348F is amended to read, a regional plan or amendment shall be adopted by not less than a 60% vote of the commissioners representing municipalities in accordance with the bylaws of the Regional Planning Commission and immediately submitted to the legislative bodies of the municipalities that comprise the region. The plan or amendment shall be considered duly adopted 35 days after the date of adoption unless within 35 days of the date of adoption the Regional Planning Commission receives certification from the legislative bodies of a majority of the municipalities in the region, vetoing the proposed, proposed plan or amendment. In case of such a veto, the plan or amendment shall be deemed rejected. Under adoption, the Regional Planning Commission shall submit the plan or amendment to the Vermont Environmental Review Board, established under 10 BSA Chapter 151, which shall approve the plan or amendment if it determines that the plan or amendment is consistent with the goals of section 4302 of this title. The plan or amendment shall take effect on the issuance of such, such approval. The board shall issue its decision within 30 days after receiving the plan or amendment. Section 8, 24 BSA, Section 4348A is amended to read, elements of a regional plan. A regional plan shall be consistent with the goals established in section 4302 of this title and shall include the following. A land use element, which shall consist of a map and statement of present and prospective land uses that indicates those areas proposed for forests, recreation, agriculture, 
using the agricultural lands identification process established in 6 VSA section 8. Residence, commerce, industry, public, and semi-public uses, open spaces, areas reserved for, flood, for floodplain, and areas identified by the state, regional planning commission, regional planning commissions, or municipalities that require special consideration for aquifer protection, for wetland protection, for the maintenance of forest blocks, wildlife habitat and habitat connectors, or for other conservation purposes. Indicates those areas within the region that are likely candidates for designation under sections 2793, downtown development districts, 2793A, village centers, 2793B, new town centers, and 2793C, growth centers of this title. Indicates those areas that are important, that are important as forest blocks and habitat connectors, and plans for land development in those areas to minimize forest fragmentation and promote the health, viability, and ecological function of forests. A plan may include specific policies to encourage the active management of those areas for wildlife habitat, water quality, timber production, recreation, or other values or functions identified by the Regional Planning Commission. Indicates those areas that constitute critical resource areas as defined in 10 BSA Section 6001. Section 9, 24 BSA Section 4382 is amended to read the plan for a municipality. A plan for a municipality shall be consistent with the goals established in Section 4302 of this title and compatible with approved plans of other municipalities in the region and with the regional plan and shall include the following. <laughs> dot, dot, dot. Um, so I'm looking at the time and I'm thinking of our Legislative Council's ability to keep reading to us. And I'm thinking <laughs> that um, it might be appropriate to pause here and have Laura and Ellen come up with another two hour chunk starting. We would pick up back here and then have time for the committee to ask questions and have a conversation with Ellen. Um, on kind of what we've heard. Well done, good reading. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, uh, Ellen. That was a marathon. <laughs> <laughs> Frequently, because I know you will be looking at it regularly. 
uh, please uh, either let me or Laura know and we will properly recycle them or hand them to someone who does want to pour over. We do have both of those, the appendices and the report. Yes, the, re the report is now on the legislative reports page as well as your page. Yep, so if you want to find it, it is easy for you to find online. With the appendices. With the appendices. And I think there is a separate document without the appendices <coughs> if you don't want all right. 700 pages, ah, right there. 765 pages. Jacob Hemmerich, Planning Policy Manager uh, in the Department of Housing and Community Development, and I'm here to give uh, an overview of land use at a very introductory level. Um, so uh, fortunately, I didn't, there's, there's no withstandings or prescribed in this presentation. And, uh, and we were rushing around this morning because there was no water at National Life, so we didn't bring the handouts that so we're supposed to bring. So, so I apologize for that. And this is the first time that I've been a witness uh, in any committee before the legislature. So, Are your handouts so. available on our webpage, or they're not yet? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. We, we love to be paper-free. Okay. So uh, if, uh, if it pleases the chair, uh, feel free to interrupt me throughout the presentation and ask any questions. And before we begin, I just thought it would be useful to know how many of you, even in the room, have uh, served on local planning commissions, development review boards, conservation commissions. That's that's great. I think I think those those raised hands uh, and that volunteerism makes Vermont really strong. It's what makes the local planning framework and regional planning framework work throughout the state. And most folks that get involved in planning can identify what makes a healthy healthy community, but it's certainly a lot harder to build the infrastructure that supports one. And that's because land use and community planning is complex and ongoing. But it really matters. It shapes the quality of lives we live in communities across the state. And it shapes the lives of future Vermonters. And if we don't plan, we are planning to fail. Does anybody know who uh, said, oh, my, my, oh, I just, I can see a great image, but you guys can't. No. Well, there's a cool, uh, cool picture of Benjamin Franklin the in a coonskin yeah. cap. Hit the button again. So hit the button again? Oh, there we go. It was an animation. There we go. To, I gave it away. <laughs> uh, so why do we plan? Community planning is a lot like retirement planning. We know we need to do it, but it's not always easy or fun. But as Benjamin Franklin said, by doing nothing, I'm setting myself up for failure. So just like successful individuals, households, and businesses, successful local, state, and regional governments plan for the future. And throughout the state, there are just incredible examples, like, like this one in Winooski here, uh, um, of towns that are bringing plans to life and transforming their communities. Land use planning does that, and it empowers communities to proactively shape the future. And without it, we default to reactive decision making that can really erode our quality of life. It can waste public taxpayer money and it, it can mean missed opportunities for, for communities. Nearly every policy made in this building uh, shapes land use, from energy to uh, 
transportation, environmental protection, to economic development, from taxation to water quality. Coordinating all these policies is, is very difficult, and I like to think of Vermont's planning framework, especially at the local and regional levels, like a Swiss Army knife. It's a handy way to coordinate diverse policies into an integrated multi-use tool ready to solve problems. And you can typically find in the plan data, analysis, vision, policy, and actions that a community intends to take. And although we don't successfully act on every plan we make, the process almost always makes us better informed. That's because planning activates the shared wisdom of the participants and builds community, and sometimes even horses, right? It asks questions like, what kind of growth can we afford? And why aren't businesses moving to our community? Uh, Vermont really has a long history. I'm good. Okay. Vermont has a long history of building the planning framework we use to solve today's challenges, and more importantly, tomorrow's challenges. Um, a key thing to know about Vermont's planning framework is municipal authority. And uh, of course, there's the U.S. Constitution, and there's federal case law, and there's federal law, uh, but. Um, but some states uh, give broad authorities to local governments, and they're called home rule states. And some states give narrow authority, uh, and they're called Dillon's rule states. Uh, Judge Dillon of Iowa ruled that municipal governments have only those powers expressly granted to them by the state legislature. And Vermont is a Dillon's rule state. And so we, uh, the legislature um, establishes general municipal law and, uh, and it allows municipality to depart from that law through charters. And most municipal law is found in Title 24 and that includes the Planning Act. Um, so the Act began in 1921 when Vermont formally enabled municipal plans and planning commissions for the con no, I'm sorry uh, to interrupt. This is great. Um, just interested to know if you have a comparison between Dillon rule and home rule in terms of the, the benefits and potential consequences so that we have a better understanding as to what was our forefathers thinking in adopting a, a Dillon rule approach towards municipal governance. You know, I, I don't know the answer to that. But it's something that we could look into and, and look back with. Uh, th there's a there's a there's a, a spectrum of states. Um, some have very strong home rules. Some are Dillon, uh, and there's a, a lot that kind of have a hybrid system. Um, but uh, but I'll make note of that question and come back. So the Planning Act began in 1921 when Vermont formally enabled municipal plans and planning commissions for the convenience, utility, and public welfare. And those are themes that. Um, uh, that uh, cross um, that, that throughout planning across the country, um, and I skip this and I'm jumping slides here. It's skipping two slides. So uh, in 1930, I'm just uh, I'll, I'll do this from memory, memory. But in 1931, the state first enabled zoning, and that's because um, uh, we were really urbanizing. So it looks like if you're following along on your own iPad, it, the skip slides are there. Oh, they are there. Okay. I'm not sure why that's a, uh, yeah. Whatever. Um, so we have plans in 21. We have uh, local regulation in 1931. And in 1960s, the 1960s were really a landmark decade for planning in, in Vermont. And that's because uh, the 50s brought the ski resorts, the highways, uh, IBM, a major employer, and, uh, and we were really seeing unprecedented change and municipalities that were unprepared uh, to, uh, to manage some of the growth that was going on. And Governors Hoff and Davis turned to planning to set a vision for Vermont's preferred pattern of development that remains today. They priorities prioritized planning for development so as to maintain the historic settlement pattern of compact villages and urban centers separated by rural countryside. So this and not this. They recognized that Vermont's traditional settlement pattern really makes Vermont Vermont and that it's integral to our economy and quality of life and it's Vermont's key, keystone land use goal. And now I skip to 14. Let me uh, just exit, exit out of this. You want to present from the... You can present from an iPad if you want. Page. We have an iPad. 
from yeah, oh, the yeah, legislative page yeah. uh, to that. <laughs> So we got through 1960, we come to 1968, that's when Vermont did a major overhaul of the Municipal and Regional Planning Act, expanding the role of regional planning and planning commissions and strengthening municipal planning. And I, I want you to keep in mind that the Planning Act is not Act 250, the state's land use act, which came into play two years later. Act 250 created the state use land use planning and regulation, and it enabled planning policies, maps, and development review criteria. Uh, and the development review criteria survived the 70s, but the Natural Resources Board Capability and Development Plan did not for regulatory use. Even so, state agencies actively plan, and that's this slide here, actively plan in coordination with other state, regional, and local partners, and state plans affecting land use must be consistent with the planning goals and compatible with the regional and approved local plans. 1988 it rolled around, and that was the last really major amendment to the Planning Act, and that reworked the framework for coordinated planning and growth management. It enhanced shared count accountability across state, regional, and local governments, and with the state's planning goals, which I'll detail uh, shortly. And just to give the specifics of that, there are 14 planning goals that were re regional and municipal plan requirements, which you just heard a few few of in the proposed legislation, an optional regional review and approval of municipal plans, and funding for municipal and regional planning. Uh, I won't dwell on the uh, 14 goals, or, or list all 14, but there are 14 planning goals, and they're very comprehensive in scope, from flood resilience to economic development, housing, natural resources, wildlife transportation, public facilities and utilities, uh, a long list. In terms of regional planning, uh, Vermont does not have strong county government, and in the absence of county government, we have 11 regional planning commissions, and they're, they're integral to helping towns uh, cooperate and plan for their futures. 2.9 million is allocated annually to the regional planning commissions through the municipal and regional planning fund with monies from the property transfer tax. And DHCD, the Department of Housing and Community Development, administers annual performance grants for those funds based on work plans. All of their work that they do according to those work plans is uh, documented in BAPTA's annual report. And BAPTA is the association that reps, represents RPCs and highlights things like, oh, uh, yeah, I, um, yeah, I was just, just going with it. I think you can keep up though. I mean, some of them are on there, like the planning goals are there. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, you can follow on your iPad, so yeah, you, you can see there the planning goals, so that might be the best way to go with this, unless we want to pause and try to fix it, so, all right. I mean, it's not at all up there anymore? I mean, it's not. It's just not, yeah. Can you do it on your iPad? We can, we can, not, I think we can just unplug this, yeah. First, our water goes out. <laughs> it's, it's been a day. So. I 
have a great one. Oh, yeah. Oh, cool. You can see the 14 planning goals. You can see a little bit about the regional planning commissions. They don't, they mostly follow county boundaries, but they're not all, uh, they don't perfectly align with the, with the counties. And so, municipal planning. Uh, the communities that choose have a choice to plan, it's an optional exercise, um, but those that do do so in eight year cycles and have the option of having the plan confirmed by the RPC for conformance. Now, towns, uh, town plans may be consistent with the planning goals, but must be consistent if the town wants to seek regional approval. It's kind of, it's a somewhat important distinction. And regional approval is essential in order to qualify for state grants? Yeah, RPC opens, well, it's, it's, it's really a grant-by-grant grant program, but um, there are many grants like the Municipal Planning Grant, Better, Con Better Connections Grant for Downtown Revitalization, there's uh, uh, Agency of Transportation Walk Bike Ped um, that looks for approved municipal plans, and often they're looking to connect the project back to content that's in that plan. Same thing with designation eligibility, the state designated areas that Chris is going to talk about after me. And I think qualification for emergency relief assistance, where you're sharing from the state. So the EREF, uh, emergency relief assistance, you know, I don't know off offhand if uh, an approved plan is required, but I know they have a checklist that if they meet that, then the municipality gets a higher, um, higher rate of assistance. So the elements of a municipal plan, drafting, so drafting one of these plans, 14 goals, 12 out elements, it's no small feat for uh, many volunteers, but it, it helps communities achieve shared goals. And so these are the 12 items that must be included in uh, a municipal plan. And it's pretty much the same list for a regional plan, except that a regional plan does not have to have a separate educational facilities element. When it comes to planning, if you're if you're not doing it with people, they think you're doing it to them. Yeah. <laughs> so I think this is just a, a nugget of wisdom. And and although planning commissions prepare uh, the plan for adoption and locally the select the board uh, or the voters approve it, representative public participation is really critical to any plan success. It can fall flat uh, without without a lot of broad outreach. The other thing that's important is accessibility, and plans containing lots of useful data, and many municipalities and RPCs are working on ways to make them even more accessible than they are, more user-friendly, and more action-oriented. Uh, I just read Berlin's town plan last week, 36 pages. Uh, it's uh, concise, visually rich. Towns and regions are doing some pretty innovative things. Act 90 also emphasized implementation accountability in, uh, in municipal plans. So municipalities must be actively implementing their plan to maintain RPC con confirmation. And implementation can look like a variety of things. It could be regulatory or non-regulatory. Regulatory implementation could include zoning regulation, and non-regulatory implementation could include capital planning. And capital planning is, by and large, the one of the most common uh, common implementation techniques. And so there's the list of implementation tools that are, that are typical. Municipalities have come a long way since 1921 in Vermont. Uh, communities with approved plans, for instance, consistently average above 80%. And uh, as of this month, 78% uh, of municipalities have chosen to regulate uh, for using zoning or subdivision. To understand the scope of the people that are involved, more than 5,000 volunteers are planning for more than $90 billion in property value. Now, that's a, that's a big community of planners and, uh, and a huge responsibility. So to gain a sense of what this means in terms of population, what would you guess the median population of Vermont town is? Median. <laughs> 5,000? We have 5,000. We have 1,000. 1,000, okay. The average. The median. So it's uh, 1,222. So, well done. 
In the typical Vermont town, volunteers undertake uh, this, this really huge responsibility on their evenings and weekends and with limited resources. And it's a system that can easily be overwhelmed with legislation that doesn't recognize this level of municipal capacity. Uh, but DHCD, the department, offers several resources to support municipal planning. For instance, municipal planning grants have been a critical source of funding to support municipal planning over the years. And this year, we had more than almost $1 million in requests and awarded $450,000 to 67 communities to support a, a variety of municipal planning projects. Another great resource we have is the Municipal Planning Manual. And this was completely updated in 2016. We've linked it, uh, or Laura's linked it kindly in your, in your, on your web page. And we also uh, publish a planning atlas. And that has external links where you can find the current plans and regulations of, of every community. So what's the impact? What difference has all this work made? And uh, I, think it's, I think it's easy to point to Vermont failures to live up to this foremost uh, land use goal. Uh, but I'm certainly struck by the differences I see when I travel around the country. And especially, you know, you can go over to the Adirondacks and see hollowed out village centers or, um, or rivers that you wouldn't want a, a kid to swim in. Um, but what is true in the 1920s or what was true in the 1920s and 30s and 60s and 80s remains true today. Uh, when Vermont focuses on its land use goals, it achieves many goals. And that's because we know that compact development offers the best ROI on public infrastructure, return on investment of public infrastructure. It's energy efficient pattern. <coughs> it grows healthier people. Walkable areas are 2.5 times more likely than unwalkable areas to get 30 minutes of daily activity. It expands transportation choice and makes transit work. Uh, it, it's really appealing to downsizing seniors and millennials and making our, our centers more economically competitive. And it's better for the environment than scattered, scattered development. Um, I think the challenges of today aren't that different than many of the questions Vermont was asking in the 60s and, you, and you're asking is, you know, how, does, how do we make center development the first and best option? How can we encourage coordination and cooperation among governments? How do we make our planning inclusive and representative of everybody in town and everybody in the region? And how can we bring plans off the shelf with funding that puts communities, community priorities into action? Thank you. Thank you. Anybody have questions? Representative Forgates. It doesn't make any difference, but how do you come up with a median population of 1,222 when there's 650,000 people in the state and there are 251 towns and municipalities? The median is half the median. And half the it's the bin. It's not the average. Okay. It's the middle bin. Okay. Versus the mean. Which are there. The mean more, is more the small average. towns than there are big towns. Yeah. Your four points of the challenges did not get transcribed on this, but I think that was really helpful. I quickly tried to write them down. Um, I imagine there are other challenges too as we go into the 21st century and, and find um, the, you know, the need for, um, for, for um, economic development, broadband, you know, other services we're looking for to while this still facing some of these challenges. Can you just send us those four bullet I tried to write it down, Senator, the way you talked about them and yeah. I would just like to memorialize and think about that because it's um, I think that's really powerful for us to be envisioning the the value of what planning can provide for communities. You know the other challenge we have is just as you pointed out in an earlier quote of the goals we love the being from a rural community. We love that condensed nature and, and of of the uniqueness of each of those villages, and not to see it sprawl in towards you know a um, losing that identity of those communities. And so that's another you know further challenge of how to provide for services such as you know maybe it's wastewater or something. While at the same time trying to 
support our communities and maintaining or enhancing their own identities. So if we could just get those. Absolutely. And then the other thoughts. All right, great, thank you. Thank you. Maybe we'll take a five minute break ourselves. Come back at 3.30. expensive to develop in our downtowns. Uh, it's a lot more difficult to permit projects because you have neighbors that you have to work with. Um, there's infrastructure challenges, there's limited access to the site, the land is more expensive. So you know, without some kind of financial incentive in there to help close this gap, this is the kind of cheapest and easiest development we see in Vermont. And many people are alarmed by this. Our partners at the NRC have some reports on parcelization and forest fragmentation. This is the kind of result that we get um, when kind of the least uh, and the cheapest uh, type of development is what we support. Um, we want to protect our farms. We want to keep them prosperous. We want to keep them healthy. And uh, I think the thing to think about in our, as our downtowns, as we support compact development within these centers, it encourages um, higher and better use of that existing land, and it takes the pressure to develop off you know, to our farmland. So the houses won't be built here if there's more opportunities in places close um, to where our jobs and services are. In many ways, um, you know, I, I see community planning as we're making decisions much like a farmer who needs to decide what kind of crops are going to return the biggest return on his investment. Um, that's the goal. I wouldn't say all communities do the best job doing that. Um, and here's some basic information about kind of some of the fiscal and environmental benefits of compact development. Other people call it smart growth, as another term. But um, while developers, you know, it's cheaper and easier for them to develop in the countryside. It's not cheaper and easier for the rest of us when that sprawling kind of development pattern occurs. And there are many studies that show kind of the difference in cost benefit between investing and developing multi-story buildings in a compact center versus you know, a little small subdivision. Um, and this costs all of us. Question. Yes. Um, I love this slide. Thank you. It may be missing one other part, and that's the cost to communities per $100 of, of assessed value of non-development. Last I knew it was uh, 85 cents, $85 per hundred versus uh, 130 or something for developed land. And you can see 130 is even way, way low. Do you know what that is now? I don't know. You have to talk to someone from the tax firm. I can try to get some additional that, You know what, that would be awesome because as you're well aware, this committee is working to protect now in the Act 50 undeveloped land. And, and when you look at these two differences and then project, if we didn't do anything to the land, how much does that save the community? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's really hard to study in Vermont. Um, this is a study from um, another jurisdiction because we just we just don't have the rate of development you know, to really do a good study. But My information is actually from New Hampshire. Yeah. Sure. Um, maybe 20 years. And we're not digressing a bit, but we do have, you know, current use is a great tool to support, kind of, um, to discourage rural, you know, development. Um, but is it enough? I guess it's a good question. Yeah, it is actually 50. Right. Thank great, you. great question. <laughs> I would call it Deb Brighton did a study mm -hmm. about, again, I think that was about, she did a recent study, but she also did one about 15 years ago. Not, that substantiated this looking at pilot projects around the state. What, yeah, and I that. remember Spark up from much of it. Yeah, um, it, it's hard to, it, it can be done. It's just usually um, we're limited by time and money to be able to do it. But yeah, the basic, being an economist. Yeah. But the basic tenets are true. You know, we can kind of see the logic of it. You know, we're getting more bang for our mile of infrastructure, mile of road, mile of all these things. Yeah, which leads me to our next slide. You know. Impervious surface is, is a big issue of concern for this committee. Um, we need it. Everybody needs a road, but in the compact center, you're getting more jobs and more um, value out of that same square acre of impervious surface than you are in kind of a rural setting. Um, so we follow that. So for you know, so wow. an acre of road uh, that serves one house, 
um, whereas an acre of road in a, in a settled area is, is getting, we're getting a lot more benefit for that than previous um, Compact development supports some of our air quality goals and um, reduces our emissions as well. And this is a study from, um, this is a census data uh, that shows vehicle miles traveled depending on where you live. And you will see in any of our designated communities, um, the, the amount of vehicle miles traveled is substantially lower than some of our other areas. And the cost of transportation, in, you know, it's a fact of life in a rural state that we, many of us need a car, but it's, it's very expensive, and this has um, a, a detrimental effect on lower income people. Um, the cost of usually living in a compact center, um, I should do the next slide, is, is often higher than driving out to a rural house and, and buying in that market. Um, but when you look at the cost from an energy standpoint, when you look at it from a fuel standpoint, they often balance out. So the real cost of your housing should include transportation. Um, and if you live in a center, um, you, you can significantly reduce your transportation costs. And it comes with significant environmental benefits. We lost everybody? No. We're good. All right. Um, I have a child, and she is healthy, but a lot of American children are getting heavier and heavier. It's because we spend a lot of time, probably on video games, but it's just, uh, the fact of the matter is we spend a lot of time in our cars. Um, there's significant studies that show communities that kids that live in communities where they can walk to school, ride a bike, and there's opportunities for them. Um, they are a lot healthier. And this is a study in Vermont. Um, people would really like to live in these areas if they, if there were opportunities. There's just not enough. Of enough of them that they can afford. Which the magic number for close enough I, I used to know was a quarter of a mile or um, a half a mile. And a half. Yeah, I mean it's different contexts, you know, we, we generally look at villages, you know, a quarter mile is, is walkable in a village context and then a half a mile in a you know, in a downtown um, is a walkable area. Uh, but there's topography, you know, there's lots of kind of variables. So got some of the reasons why uh, compact development makes sense um, and you know just to reiterate you know it supports a lot of our land use values it just it makes economic sense it makes environmental sense um, it's, it's, it's good for our people um, and it saves money just does that map show what kind of designation? Any of those designations? No, it doesn't. Um, this this just shows the towns with designations. I'm sorry. It just shows towns that have one of the designations. Any of the five. Any of the five. And many communities will have multiple designations. If you want additional information on that, Jacob um, had a link to that planning atlas. Um, you can look up all the different <coughs> designations there. It'll show. You know, you can zoom in. You can figure out the exact boundaries. So that's available there. Is it? I see my. One of my communities, I thought, had a designation that's blank. So I don't know what the age is. Yeah, I think it's current. Um, <laughs> so, overarching view: compact development supports a lot of our values. Um, planning and, and regulation itself is not is not the answer. Um, Act Two Fifty is not really cracking the nut by itself. <laughs> Um, so about 20 years ago, the legislature decided to create these designation programs. Um, they came at different times um, over the years, and they were developed for different reasons. Um, the first was the downtown designation program, um, which was established in 1998. We have 23 of them, and they are the kind of the major towns. So it's like the Montpelier, the St. John's Ferries, Barry, you know, the bigger, bigger principal communities. Um, um, the primary benefit that our downtowns get are tax credits, but they also receive special funds to you know, make um, pedestrian uh, improvements in the downtown area. They also receive special training and, and service from the state. 
Next was Villages, you know, it's like, it's great that you did this for the downtowns, but we want some too. Um, so down, our Villages are much, much smaller, and I'm going to show you different examples so you can see the scale of these things. Um, really, the only major benefit they get are these tax credits, and I'll talk about tax credits in a second. Next came Newtown Centers, where it was basically, it's great that these traditional centers have a designation, but what about communities that never had a heart? Never had a traditional center, so think South Burlington. And, only had a heart. Yeah. So think South Burlington and Colchester. You know some of our more modern um, areas where they were kind of exurban housing development. And many of these communities really truly want a center, but they would, they would like a, to recognize an area and tools to develop a new town center. These are our imagine an egg. So these top three are kind of our core designations. So the tiny little middle and these other these add-on designations are the rings around these areas so they're the white part of the egg and the, the upper ones are the yellow part of the egg so one is the compact usually commercial core of a community and the other destinations are the larger areas that surround them one is housing focused we have a housing problem in the state a lot of the housing in and around our downtowns and villages is in poor condition it makes it hard to recruit people here to get jobs when they see our housing stock is in poor shape um, so this was a designation um, designed to encourage and support new housing development in and around our centers. Um, and then there was a larger area designated called the Rose Centers. There's a limited number of communities designated. There's six of these. And you'll see, I'll show you the scales. I think these are much, much larger areas. For practical matters, you can't fit everything, every type of use you want in a compact center. You know, um, like it or not, car dealerships need to be somewhere, you know, and they need to go in a place, and let's figure out a framework where we can plan for them and make sure that they are located and sited in a way that doesn't hurt the vitality of the village center, that it all hangs together. So those were the different programs we have. They serve different purposes. One's focused on, you know, community revitalization and fixing up existing buildings. One's focused on housing. And one, the growth center is more focused on planning Imagining what your town should be, and how can we you know, use these regulatory tools and incentives to kind of build this out? Any questions there? Pretty good. End of the day, we're almost there. <laughs> um, so I've talked a little bit about I think the major benefits. You know, are are, are some money, um, but also technical support. Um, Communities that are designated um, are often recognized by our sister agencies. Like, you know, if they apply for a bike pet grant and they have a designation, they get extra points, so they're more likely to receive funding over other communities. Um, a little bit of kind of why we're here to give you this context is Act 250 recognizes the designation. Act 250 talks about um, existing settlements. Um, and while our designated areas aren't necessarily equal to existing settlements, that's kind of as close as we could get. Um, they're eligible for reduced fees um, and exemptions from land gains taxes in the neighboring development areas. Um, this is a project you guys all spent time in Montpelier. This is the French block. Um, this building, um, the upper floors had been vacant since the time of FDR. They just had the ribbon cutting um, a couple of weeks ago. It's 18 new units of housing in the downtown. Um, the reason why it wasn't developed is a long story of history, but partly due to economics. We want, this is an existing building, but the upper floors were not being used because it costs a lot of money to install an elevator, it costs a lot of money to install a sprinkler system, and bring these buildings out to grow. So this is why we have these tax credits that are designed to kind of close that gap and kind of make these marginal developments happen that otherwise wouldn't. They don't generate a lot of square foot revenue in these buildings, um, and without this piece in there to kind of make the financing work, the banks wouldn't buy it. So this has been a wildly successful program. You know, it's just in ways and means we've asked for an increase uh, because demand is significantly exceeding what we have available. Uh, but if you see, you know, we've, we've done a lot of these. This is a five-year snapshot. You know, I think what's great is, you know, $11 million in these tax credits have leveraged, you know, over $150 million in private investment. And Representative Ansel loves this because what we're doing is we're taking general fund money and we're growing the grant list, which is the education fund. Um, so it's a very popular program and it's really made a difference. This is why many of our communities are, are seeing their buildings fixed up. And usually one building kind of spurs the next neighboring building for them to consider making an improvement as well. Can you 
just um, what what you and I talked about the other day. <clears throat> give sort of tax credit 101, like who buys them, how does it work? Explain just the hype. A little bit more than you have. About yeah, sure. Why um, and how they work. So um, you have two options. You know, handing out money in the state. You can either give people a grant, um, or you can give people a tax credit. Most Vermonters do not have sufficient tax liability. And if I give you a $50,000 tax credit, you may be hard pressed to claim that on your taxes. So the mechanism that's allowed is um, banks purchase these credits. Um, so if I'm the lender on the construction project and I have an allocation of tax credits from the state of Vermont, essentially the state of Vermont is putting its full faith and credit behind this project, saying, you know, finance this project. If this project is complete, then you'll be able to purchase these credits. So the banks buy the credits, um, they discount them a little bit. So if you give them $100, they'll give you $95 back. Um, they make a little profit. I mean, they, they're putting their money up at risk, so I think it's a reasonable cost. Um, but it makes these projects happen that otherwise wouldn't, because they can't be financed by kind of the revenue streams that you can charge you know, for a unit. Is it a national market that they sell these tax credits? Yeah, well, there are. There's, there's federal tax credits and there's state of Vermont tax credits. So our state of Vermont, downtown and village center tax credits, just, just, us. just us. And the people who can buy them are local banks um, and insurance companies and um, um, what's our, um, our captive insurers. They can buy them. Um, they have the tax liability um, and they make a little bit of money in the deal and they make these projects happen. So everybody's kind of happy in the end. As far as the grand list, you know, the presumption is but for these credits, the improvement wouldn't happen. So we get the improved building, the value of these buildings increases, and that small little incentive that we paid is paid back in perpetuity because these people are paying higher property taxes. And is there sort of, there's unspent demand there for that? You, you, you're, you're in ways and means asking for an increase in yeah. the cap on this program? Right, so there's a $2.4 million cap right now. The governor's budget asked for a $200,000 increase. Um, but the reality is, there's, you know, I've got the numbers on a separate sheet. Um, I want to say we had $2 million more in requests than we had available funding this last round. And then that's also a reduction in revenue coming to the state. Uh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's foregone revenue. Um, but if you accept the argument, and what it says that this is an investment in infrastructure, housing and buildings, that's not moving anywhere. It is increases the value of the grand list, and it revitalizes our community. There's a lot of kind of spin-off values that these investments have. So the state, if, you know, down the road, gets this money back because the buildings have an improved value. They're a higher property tax than they otherwise would have without the improvements, so they get that rich money investment. Pretty quickly, we've done some analysis, some projects as little as like two and three years, the state's tax credit investment is paid back and increased property taxes. Just a quick question, um, are there any moderate income conditions on these things? Yeah, it really just depends. Um, and my second part is if private developers are part of that private investment. Yeah, it's, this, our program is primarily, it's the major tool for private property, small time developers, non-profit developers to use. Um, we typically do support affordable housing projects, um, but we kind of have an unsaid agreement, you know, only if they're really needed. Like this, this project um, was supported by DHCD, um, the Community Development Block Grant Program, and our program. It was a big, expensive project, and they had a gap they needed to fill, so they came in. The most affordable housing projects in our downtown settings, for the same reason the economics don't work, and but for kind of BHCB and other partners making these investments, they're just not going to happen. So now this is affordable housing? Uh, portions of it are, it's mixed. Um, it's market rate and affordable. Yeah. Uh, is this project built out and, and built now? I think, I don't know the exact answer, but I th they had their grand opening about a month ago, and there was a very long waiting list for tenants. If they're fully filled in now, I don't know. Well, but, that, that, that answers. Yeah. But there's huge demand. And I guess my point is, you know, if, if there's opportunities for people to live in these areas, we need to make more of them, because people do want to live there. And um, there is a lot of kind of concern about our growing demographic. I live in Calais. I live in the middle of the woods. I'm 70, I don't want to live there. This is where I want to live, because I want to be around people my age, and I want to be able to walk to the store and the doctor's office and the pharmacy, and uh, that 
kind of where I want to land, and our demographics are changing, so we need to look for opportunities to kind of make it easier to develop in these centers, because otherwise, you know, in the macro sense, housing is going to happen somewhere, um, and if you don't do something to ha make it happen here, it will happen out in the rural countryside, because it's cheaper. Um, another thing that we're talking about, I mean, too much. Okay, we started a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, another, and this is a little bit of a, um, just a preview, Act 250 recognizes these centers, and right now this picks up on your question, um, for, for projects that meet certain affordability standards, um, and they're located with, in these centers, they can be exempted from Act 250 review. This has been a significant savings in kind of the time it takes to bring a project to the permitting, it saves about six months off the permitting time frame, and it saves about fifty or sixty thousand dollars on a project. And ultimately, these are these are this is funding that the state pays for. Um, but it, uh, by making these projects happen more quickly um, and providing these opportunities in areas where people want to go, um, it supports our overall environmental values. So this is a quick. Um, just to give you perspective on areas of land of the different designation. This is somewhat out of date because we do add designations uh, once a month when the downtown board meets. Um, the big blob in the corner is Vermont's total land area on down to the different designations. Gross centers 12 square miles, villages 8 square miles, downtowns 3, neighborhoods 2, and new town centers you can barely even see a 0.3 square miles. The point here is, and I like to think of this as, you know, we talk about critical habitat for critters. This is, this is important habitat for people. You know, these are areas where people need to, to live. And we want to make sure that these areas um, are, can be both built out to the extent they can, because it takes pressures off the other areas. So I'm going to quickly go through the different designations, where they are, and kind of get you a sense of their relative size. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, again, our premier top shelf um, designation is downtowns. These are our larger communities all over the city, 23 of them. The size of downtowns varies. Burlington is our largest designated downtown at 208 acres, and Bristol is our tiniest at 2.3. Um, and then you can see some information on the distribution. They're generally <coughs> super, super small compact areas. They're the commercial core of the community. Here's two larger examples, so you can see Burlington. So notice we didn't designate the neighborhoods that surround the traditional commercial core. We just designate kind of the business district. Um, same with Bristol. It is just kind of Main Street. It is not the neighborhoods that surround. Scale very different. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you, you're familiar with it, so you know the scale is different. Just saying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, That's an adult one. Just out of curiosity, why um, a, a town the size of Bristol would go for a downtown designation as opposed to a village designation? Because they get more benefits. Um, there's um, a, a, a transfer, the downtown transportation fund um, that enables them to make pedestrian improvements. I don't know if you know Bristol very well, but there's a market back behind there. Yeah. All the streetscaping and all kind of the pedestrian improvements to make that a nicer, better connected place, the improvements they made to their village green were all funded with the downtown transportation fund. And what's that sort of, if it's the premier designation, what, give us an example of the difference that, what, what do these towns have to demonstrate in order to get them to see so their own? They, they have to create a nonprofit organization to support um, the community re revitalization effort and make sure that there's a decent mix of businesses. We've learned that just because you build it, they won't necessarily come. And so you need the community fully invested in you know, revitalizing the community, marketing the businesses, and supporting them. Um, otherwise, you know, it's a tough market. And we're competing against you know, large internet retailers. And unless the community is going to support the local businesses and make sure there's a good mix of businesses, it's hard to keep the it's vital. Um, and it's, it's a hard lift for many communities just to maintain another focused on downtown We have one. I didn't realize it was part of our designation requirement. Thank you. Um, the Lynn Center designation, again, much, much smaller 
Um, this is really our growth sector. You know, you hear a lot of concerns in this building about the needs for rural economic development, and these tax codes are a great tool to do a small project. You know, it's an existing building, we want to improve it, and because the scale is so small, we find it does make a difference. Um, you know, like a, like that example, the village store getting revitalized in the community and reopened after years of being closed, it makes a huge difference. Um, usually one or two of these small buildings leverages another improvement, so it, it, it doesn't happen overnight, um, and our downtowns and our rural areas didn't decline overnight, but we've seen remarkable success in their vitality and they kind of bouncing back after years of decline. Here's a little bit on scale. Um, Richmond is our largest, maybe, I think our recently our largest designated village center. Are you familiar with Richmond? I can put in on here, but you don't know yet. Um, so it's just the commercial area, and then over here, it's Westford, tiny Westford. Um, I live in Callis, and if you're familiar with Maple Corner, it's designated village center as you know, five buildings. You know? So the scale matters. Um, but again, we're just capturing you know, the, the civic core of the community, the, the public building, the post office, and the few commercial buildings. Um, how do we make downtown transportation funding available? They have the same challenges. They absolutely do. To have pedestrian friendly connections for these well, people habitats. How do we make You should talk to Senator Clarkson. I think she's proposing a bill that's focused on obesity um, and, and it considers um, increasing the funding for um, and allowing certain villages um, to participate. But it's, it's hard. It takes money to get things done. Um, there's lots of competing priorities. Um, the chat with her. Um, new town center designation. Again, this is um, for communities without a traditional center. Um, Colchester and South Burlington. A little bit on their size. This is Colchester's village center. I mean, sorry, new town center. This was designated. Um, they presumed the CERC was going to be built, and this was going to be the new center of the community. The CERC wasn't built. Nevertheless, they've gotten some pretty good, you know, high-density development in this area, and it will be kind of fully developed. And what's nice is, you know, you'll have this compact development here, and then you'll have all this open countryside around it. So, President McCullough. So, Colchester has what I would call Historic town center, and they, but they. So, how did they get a new town center? Um, did they not apply for their, their historic? Culture is really unique, and it has like 17 centers, frankly. Okay. Okay. Uh, but they saw the opportunity in the sort coming, okay. um, and they thought it would generate a lot of trips, and they wanted to get ahead of that. So that's. We can have an old town center and a new town. Right. But that. Um, South Burlington is probably a better example of what we what the statute envisioned for um, a new town center. They've been working at this for 50 years, um, <laughs> but bless their hearts, this year they passed a huge bond, a like $25 million bond or something in that nature, to build some civic buildings in this new town center. Um, you know, the mall, the U Mall, is kind of dying. There's proposals on the table to convert a lot of that back into housing, to put a grid of streets on that, to kind of make it a core. Um, so they're putting a lot of their money where their mouth is. That first slide that I showed you of the Laird Square, um, that was a, you know, a multi-story, dense, affordable housing development within the town center. So communities can do it, um, but it just it, it takes a lot of money and planning to make it work. But where was their kind of <coughs> church, town meeting hall originally? Do you know? I don't think they ever had one. They never had one. Yeah. Um, you know, it was an outgrowth. It was, you know, suburban development outgrowth from Burlington. And Burlington essentially was their center. Yeah. Um, At some point, it was a farm community yeah. that must have had some. Okay. Right. So, Route 2, um, the de facto mm -hmm. uh, would have been described by Route 2 between um, Heinsberg Road and now the, the, the Cloverleaf. Yeah. The town hall was there. Um, yeah, shopping was in there, several yeah. grocery stores, and uh, the Grange. Thank you. 
Um, quickly, I'm going to try to speed it up a little bit. Neighborhood development areas, we need housing. Um, the health and the quality of the housing stock in and around our downtowns is integrally related to the health of the commercial center. So to the extent we have good quality housing, we have a high concentration of people who live there, they are going to shop and use that center. Um, but in many communities, the quality of the housing stock is poor. Nevertheless, there are opportunities to infill and rebuild in and around these areas, so this, this designation was aimed at. The major benefit that comes with this is, is reduction in land gains tax. So if we make an improvement, we don't have to pay the, the land gains tax when we sell the building. Um, the other major benefit is the priority housing project benefit. So projects within these areas um, um, do not have to go through activity. It is our most sophisticated and our newest designation that looks at local bylaws. And I'm telling you a little bit more about this because this kind of is the predecessor to our, our concept that's coming for enhanced designation. You know, let's ask a community to raise its standards, and if it can raise its standards, let's give it the opportunity to make decisions and, and build out in a way that supports our overall land use goals. So when we look at density, you know, can we allow the density and the development to get the most out of your existing um, infrastructure? We want to make sure that the traditional design of the neighborhood is respected. Um, we want to make sure that we have complete streets. And we want to make sure our important natural resources are protected. And we also don't want to see people build in the flood plain. Uh, we've learned some lessons. It's not the best idea. Wait, could you, are any of those existing ones within, like, Within a downtown? Within, I'm sorry, no. Within a downtown designation, any of these? Right, so the, the downtown, I'll show you, the downtown would be the core in the middle, right? and this would be a ring around it. Oh, cool. So, like Burlington's downtown area that you saw on the initial map, there's a large neighborhood area designated around it that actually extends up to the north, north end. Okay, this is Manchester's, um, um, their core, is their village center, because I guess it's on color one in orange, and the blue is their neighborhood development area. There's infill opportunities here. But you'll notice a portion is not blue, that there's a there's a brook that runs through there. It's it's um, liable to flood, so we just didn't designate that area. It's not eligible for the benefits. Um, and we asked the community to, to <coughs> have bylaws in place to ensure that this build out respects their traditional your rivers, I understand. <laughs> um, growth center designation is uh, the most difficult designation to receive. It is the most rigorous re review process. We only have six of these. Um, these are 20-year designations, and they're coming up on their 10th year right now. We have five-year check-ins on them to see how they're doing. And the goal of it is, it's a little bit of a schizophrenic program, I'll admit, uh, but the goal of it is to create an area where you want to concentrate your development your natural resources outside that area. Um, one of the metrics we look at is how much growth is happening within your growth center when they check in versus outside. And I think an overwhelming, I'm, just, I'm making up a number, but I think it's pretty close. I want to say 80% of new development in these growth center communities is occurring in their growth center. So it is a tool that works. Um, you, know, you have to get the community invested in, in the bylaws that will shape that kind of development. Um, but this kind of framework to support compact development with incentives that come along that has proven to be an effective tool. Here's two growth centers, um, St. Albans to the north. This is, in the middle is their downtown designated center, and the ring around it is their growth center. St. Albans is super tidy in their growth center because they're surrounded by St. Albans town, so they're not gonna give me to be much bigger. Um, but so that's the kind of the image that I gave you of the egg yolk with the ring around it. This is Bennington's, um, so they're designated downtown, surrounded by their growth center. <laughs> so, it's while our downtowns are important, they're important to our brand, our economy, uh, kind of our sense of place. Um, because they were traditionally built on rivers, they are all subject to a lot of uh, increased flood risk. That said, most, I think 70% of all of our businesses are located within a mile of a designated center. We may 
need significant investments in these communities. It's really hard to move them. I don't think we'll ever get enough money to move Brattleboro to another place. Um, so kind of, what are we to do? Um, we know our climate is changing. Um, we know floods will increase. It's not a matter of kind of if, it's just a matter of when. Um, so we can take steps now to protect these important kind of economic centers. It makes a whole lot of sense to make an investment now to avoid a cost than it does to kind of pay after the fact and lose all that business and kind of just close down. You know, Barry, you know, recently suffered floods. You know, it was a big mess to clean up. You know, Montpelier every year risk of floods. Brattleboro last week ice jam flooded <coughs> a lot of the um, um, new housing development. So it's we need to get out of this, and this, there's an opportunity to do this. Um, and um, we've been working at this for a while, and um, this kind of concept of um, allowing our, our compact development centers to kind of support the infill, um, flood-proof these buildings um, so they can withstand and weather the next events. Um, but let's work so we can discourage development on the floodplain outside these centers. Let's figure out tools where we can kind of restore floodplain and remove the berms to protect these areas. There's lots of opportunities to restore river function up and down from these areas and to reduce the impacts of future floods. And this is kind of the basis of the enhanced designation proposal that we hope to tell you more about in the coming weeks, where we provide incentives <coughs> to make our buildings floodproof, um, and we encourage communities to, to pass the local bylaws to discourage development of flood Are there incentives, Chris, or, or are there expected to be for um, agricultural firms that get created prior to the uh, yeah, well, we haven't we haven't got that far in the conversation. Um, but I did. We had a meeting with um, Mike Fly on the Rivers program, um, and um, we'll have to see how far this proposal gets. Um, what we envisioned was, you know, we have our downtown tax credits. They mostly pay for code improvements for existing buildings, but they could also pay for flood proofing for those buildings too. That would be a big help. Um, but the ecosystem restoration program, you know, if your community got designated, maybe you would get priority consideration for the those berms that are there. Uh, maybe there's a tool to help farmers get paid when their lands get flooded. You know, there's lots of opportunities there. Um, but we need to have the conversation to figure out if, you know, is there broad support for this process? <coughs> Part of the incentive to get communities to step up is Act 250 relief. Um, so there's a trade-off. And it's something we look forward to talking to you about more in the coming weeks. So I hope this helped a little bit. I know it's a lot in late in the day, um, but thanks for your attention. It's our Monday. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions? Thank you. Great. Thanks for your attention. Great. Thank you.